Roman Empire literally dominates the history school books. Again and again, it is underlined that it is the Greco-Roman culture that uh, placed the bedrock of everything that we call civilization. Strange, though, that uh, there are no actual artifacts proving the existence of this grand empire. Also a bit strange that the cartographers that were living at the time when this empire was supposedly flourishing and was at its peak also didn't notice it. The cartographer who made this map according to Wikipedia was its citizen at the time he made it and yet it says simple Italia where Italy is situated nowadays and still the people over there call their land Italia without any indications that other lands belong to this Italia or that it is any sort of center of anything whatsoever, let alone a mighty empire. Or maybe the famous uh, map of uh, Ptolemy. Here we read, the Ptolemy world map is a map of the world known to Hellenistic society in the second century. So with big letters he mentions uh, Dutchians and Aryans and other Africans and for the supposedly the Grand Empire that was at its peak at that time just a small Italia and no sign that it was governing all the civilized world and again the, the cartographers supposedly lived in this very Roman Empire and exactly at the time of its peak now we're being told that uh, this is a copy of a 4th century uh, itinerary map showing the roads that were built and supposedly controlled and maintained by Rome in its Roman Empire. Here uh, when we rotate the map probably you will notice the peculiar boot shape of Italy on it. Instead of the grand the Roman Empire, we simply see simple Italia and moreover the place it is found nowadays, not bigger than that. E, or maybe this E, Ta, Li, A. Yes, there is a king in Rome, but this doesn't mean he is uh, the king of all the countries on the map because there are other kings as well on the map. And same is the situation with all those uh, maps that the mainstream historians themselves assure us are the early world maps. Only in the 17th and 18th century these types of maps start appearing where if you have a good faith you could agree that this indeed resembles the modern maps of the Roman Empire that we see in our school books. This is a copy, 17th-18th century copy of the Oratelius uh, maps. But the 17th and 18th century, that is uh, already at the time when the new fabricated history was established. So this was uh, drawn following what they read in the books, cannot be taken as uh, proof, uh, cannot be taken as a really authentic uh, old map. Yes, it's possible and more than likely this royal cartographer of the 16th century, Abraham Ortelius, was indeed famous and respected, and that's why we read that his maps and atlases were issued in the hundreds. But here comes the interesting part. Only one single piece has survived. Numerous copies made much later have survived, and although they all respected him and copied his work, somehow, again, like with the old books, after making the copies, the originals always disappear. Why would they be so negligent with the authentic maps of the cartographer they respected so much? Or was there a cleanup of the real history before the substitute was established? For example, the World Digital Library 
offers a free digital copy of his World Atlas, supposedly the original one from the 16th century. But if you read the analysis provided by Anatoly Komenko in the book that we've provided a link to down below, you will find many details that suggest that these were much later copies, made in the 17th and 18th century. But even in its edited uh, condition, this is how he saw the antique world. You see completely different uh, countries. Scythia and Sarmatia are much uh, bigger than we are told, while the great Roman Empire is missing absolutely 100%. search together for some places where we hope to find some tangible proofs of the existence of this Roman Empire. I'll briefly touch uh, the Roman, the Latin inscriptions, the so-called uh, Roman villas, amphitheaters and even Roman cities found all over Europe, Africa and Asia and also some of the symbols of the supposed great empire in the city of Rome itself. Let's first of all clear a misunderstanding. When uh, the people in the past would say Rome, that wouldn't necessarily mean the city in nowadays Italy, but uh, there were at least three Romes. It was primarily a title. The first Rome was Istanbul, the second one the Rome we know in Italy, and the third one was Moscow. In some sort, sources you will find the places of the first two switched, but it doesn't matter anyway. The important point is that if in certain historic record it is mentioned that the rulers of Rome did this or that, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, those were exactly the emperors of the Rome located in Italy. Since there are no original Roman books that are available for the public at least, they could be in the Vatican, hidden. But anyhow, old books are not available. So let's now go first to the city of Rome itself and see if we can find some tangible proof of the existence of the empire over there on the spot. The Capitoline Wolf is the most famous symbol of Rome. That's why they have put the supposedly ancient uh, statue in their main museum. Years ago, the restorator Anna Marie Carubin noticed, because of the techniques that were used in manufacturing the statue, that it was actually late Renaissance work. Even after that, for many years, it was still exhibited in a museum as an ancient statue. Just recently, at least they are accepting that it is not, but I sincerely doubt they have removed it from the Museum of Ancient Works. Their most ancient artifact does not prove at all the existence of any vast empire at all. It happens to be just a nice artistic work a couple hundred years old, that's all. Well, that didn't work, let's try something very solid. It is this impressive statue of, supposedly, Marcus Aurelius, which dominates the square of Rome. But how do they know who it is? After all, initially it was supposed to be Emperor Constantine. Yes, there is an inscription on the stone that the statue is placed on, but it is very well known and accepted by everybody that this inscription is a Renaissance work that was later added to the statue. So who is on the original statue? That was determined following a very simple and ingenious method. 
A certain librarian a few centuries ago was browsing through all the Roman coins, and his sharp eyesight noticed a resemblance. And at that moment, he understood that on this statue, it is only Marcus Aurelius, and it cannot be anybody else. And so, it has been adopted as scientific history. Actually, if we simply start using the word Roman with its proper meaning, everything will come into place. From the works of Anatoly Fomenko, we understand that indeed the people in ancient times did call themselves Romans, Romaic, Romaic, Romas, something of that sort. But the origin of this name was not Rome in Italy, it's exactly the opposite. Eventually, the city of Rome got its name from that older word. So, if we understand a Roman to mean belonging to this ancient culture that had its basis, the knowledge that they received from the advanced civilizations before them, yes, then we can say all this is Roman, all the Roman statues, Roman cities, villas and so on. Yes, they did belong to that antique culture, but it doesn't mean that they were built or connected necessarily with the city of Rome, found nowadays in Italy. Yes, a small portion definitely were connected with the city of Rome because it was one of the big cities in this culture at a certain period, but definitely not all of it. And so we go to a museum and there are endless uh, Roman statues and all they have very clear labels who is supposedly depicted. But how do they know this, these so-called historians? Was they written on uh, the statue? That's very rare. And even if there is a name, what to speak of a history that's really not uh, written on the statue what is the history of this person maybe in extremely rare case it it will be written octavius but who was this uh, octavius uh, prince merchant priest where did he live we don't know these things they're just modern labels that uh, you know somebody decided to put there now let's look at these uh, wonderful, luxurious, uh, opulent buildings, the so-called Roman villas. The mainstream historians assure us that Romans, in sense of a people coming from uh, Rome to conquer the territories, have built them and lived in them. But yet they skip giving any evidence of why is that so. If indeed people coming from the city of Rome used to live in these villas, then why on the numerous mosaics found in the villas themselves, in everyday scenes, people of completely different races are depicted? After all, those very same historians assure us that uh, Rome in Italy was populated by the race that lives there nowadays as well, that is, Latino people. They are relatively shorter, with uh, somewhat a darker complexion and definitely dark hair, while on the mosaics we see somewhat Scandinavian-looking people, predominantly blonde, and kind of uh, tall. Most definitely, the mosaics are full of blondes. There is also a vast body of artifacts depicting black people in Roman times. The mainstream historians quickly got rid of that theme by labeling them all as slaves or servants. But a careful look at the actual artifacts will show that these were very well-placed, respected, and affluent citizens. They were definitely often rulers 
noble people, and saints. For example, Castle Gradestein is one of the numerous medieval castles of Central Europe. If we believe the official sources, the Renaissance Caucasian people of Europe should have had no clue at all about details of the African people, and yet they managed to depict so well an African male figure. Sculptors don't make such realistic statues only based on the narrations of drunken sailors who have seen something decades ago. And not just the realistic depiction, they have decided to place these two big statues besides the main entrance of the castle. Also, he is the main figure in the decoration, the metal decoration above the main entrance. And in addition, he is the main figure in the emblem of the castle. He is the center of attention also at the main fountain of the castle on the emblem, it's right in the middle. And then he is depicted together with a lion on every single side of this fountain. He is also the central figure of attention in the chapel inside the castle where we have also color frescoes. So there is no doubt that he is an African person, maybe some saint or king saint because he wears a crown. And if one does a guided tour of the castle and asks who is this central African figure, the answer is that yes, we get this question very often. It must have been somebody, they say. And if you ask more, like, yeah, it is somebody, but who? They will just tell you, well, it must have been somebody of that time. We don't know anymore. Things get lost with time. Interesting that the very minor details about this castle didn't get lost. And who was the most important figure for them who were building the castle? Exactly that we forgot. Actually, we don't want to know. That's why we don't know. So, who lived in these vias after all? Didn't the people leave some sort of record of who they were? Yes, they did. First of all, are these swastika signs. Really, they're all over. They are the main symbol of the residents of these vias. This is also an ancient sign that is present on each and every continent without exception. Even the Indians in America weave the pattern in their blankets, and it's in their ancient pottery as well. So this is definitely one of the main, if not the very main symbol of the survivor culture. And no wonder it is the main symbol in the so-called Roman vias. <laughs> The examples here are just uh, countless swastikas of all kinds of uh, and description are simply all over all Roman things. So what about inscriptions? Maybe the residents uh, wrote down something, who they are or something of this sort. Actually inscriptions, although very very rare to exist, have been found indeed in some so-called Roman villas. And this is a lovely example from Portugal, uh, the villa, the 3D reconstruction of which you see at the moment. The exceptional thing here is, as the guided tour of the villa itself on the spot tells us, at the end of the tour they mention that they have found 
200 tablets with names written on them. Interestingly enough, they mentioned that one of the names on those tablets is Roman. Well, sad that they didn't mention what is that Roman name, why they think it's Roman, and most importantly, what are all the other names? Let's see some Roman uh, villa mosaic inscriptions. I'm sure the linguistic specialists have it all figured out and they have all these endless variations of ancient languages and Latin and how the Romans uh, different types of Latin and how it originated. But if we forget all these theoretical things and look at the very inscription, what we see is that uh, most of the names can be read by the Slavic people using their current alphabet. For example, this, even the mainstream historians tell us that uh, this uh, story depicts how some clown was um, uh, taking the clothes of certain lady under this uh, pretext and, and so on and so on. But with straightforward Slavic letters, it is written satiros, that, that it is clown, we use it, that's the word even nowadays. And so is valid for uh, many other characters whose ins inscriptions I am uh, showing you right now. There is no reason whatsoever to connect these uh, inscriptions with uh, the city of Rome or some Scheherazade Roman Empire. Language is uh, absolutely similar to the writing and language the Scythians and Sarmatians were using. These were ancient people. They were always living in this, well, not always, but since thousands of years, they were living in these areas. This was their writing, why it should be categorized as Roman. And this is from a wonderful so-called Roman villa in Zygma. These so-called Roman villas were masterpieces, not only of engineering, but art as well. They had toilets with running water, floor heating, central floor heating with water, swimming pools, hundreds of fountains, running hot water, and wow, wonderful flower gardens, and so on. So looking at these facts, one would assume that they were built by specialists in their area. I mean, qualified builders and artists, right? Well, countless quality TV documentaries and even some history schoolbooks assure us that all of this was built by the Roman soldiers. In a mainstream British TV documentary aired on all prime channels, I even heard how they assure us that Roman soldiers were walking marathon distances every day. And then in the evening, they were building not only these Roman villas, but the amazing aqueducts that would have, say, a 1% variation every kilometer. Now that is a very precise calculation and construction. Also, countless municipal and public Roman buildings. That, my dear friends, is huge. That requires education. Roman soldiers were supposedly spending their lives in military education. That's what mainstream scientists assured us. They didn't have engineering or building education, and yet, with the help of equally unqualified slaves, they would build all these miracles in their spare time. Without the slightest hesitation, the penguins, they present the tales of 1,000 Arabian Nights as scientific history. Let me tell you one such tale that uh, somebody decided to write and all the others copy and paste, distributed without slightest thinking. It's about the Caesar's bridge over the river Rhein. 
it is quite a deep and big river. Uh, the bridge would be some half kilometer long. And all that the magician Aladdin, oh excuse me, the Roman soldiers, built within 10 days just complete, including, um, you know, cutting the wood, well, manually from the forest, dragging it and constructing this. And it was ready in 10 days. And here Shihirizada even uh, added a very insightful note. Oh, in our modern uh, uh, world, with our advanced technology, we are still very far away from being able to build any bridge over rain within uh, the, river, the river rain within 10 days. But the reason for that is that we don't have those thousands of soldiers that are ready to give their lives at any time to Caesar. Oh, pardon, that was not Shehirzada, that was uh, one of uh, those respected professors that sit in the expensive leather chairs doing uh, copy and paste, oh pardon, researching history. But I must say that uh, this uh, fairy tale is much less credible than the Arabian Nights because, I mean, these uh, goals that the Caesar was uh, supposedly attacking, that's why he built the bridge to get over to them. Were they just uh, sitting on the other side and uh, drinking uh, Bloody Mary and it never crossed their minds to just take their bows and uh, kill the Romans while they were so vulnerable, exposed on the bridge, coming to them. Very strange fairy tales. Once I very casually asked the real historian, by the way, he had no idea what I'm working on and what are my views and who am I, he didn't know anything about me. So I just mentioned and I said, I find it really ridiculous that uh, they uh, tell us that these uh, Roman soldiers built uh, fantastic uh, engineering uh, achievements and while they didn't even have time for it, they were always, you know, fighting and and they didn't have qualifications for it, nor the numbers. I said that it looks ridiculous from all sides. What he said was, it looks ridiculous to you because you don't know anything about history. Now, this is uh, typical. Even a known person shows slight uh, doubt in their stories. And the first thing that they automatically start with is personal insult. He continued, of course, there were master builders who were directing all that, and it, they did not come uh, from the city of Rome. If you read the uh, historical sources, you will find that Rome itself was importing qualified builders from all kinds of provinces. And then he listed the very uh, fanciful, uh, exotic uh, sounding names that I haven't heard of. That is another typical approach of them, making you uh, feel like as if you don't know anything. Thing. But later on I checked those names and they happen to be fable locations that are considered unreal fantasy by the mainstream historians and he was just uh, telling them to look well worse than me feel inferior. Another very common trick by the so-called historians. Anyhow, he continued telling me how the Romans themselves were importing uh, qualified workers and were learning and they were coming from all kinds of uh, territories, from Asia and uh, uh, Africa, territories of uh, what is supposed to be uh, far provinces of the Roman Empire. So he continued, if uh, they were uh, being hired to work in Rome, then why would you think that uh, uh, Romans had, uh, the, as, as the citizens of the city of Rome, had anything to do with uh, engineering those uh, buildings in the faraway provinces? He continued, oh my god, they were not only importing uh, ma master masons, they were importing even emperors from those places. Well, great! Sadly, he didn't know that's exactly what I was thinking anyway. But then I asked him if 
all this is known to the his historians why they perpetuate such uh, misleading lies in the textbooks and in the documentaries that it all came from the city of Rome that they invented all these things and they built them for the conquered uh, provinces this is, I mean, s basically stressed again and again. It's not a minor detail. It's the very basis of all the information that they present about the Roman Empire. I said, why those lies? If all that you just told me is indeed like this in the sources that you have read as a real historian, why do you agree with this uh, history that you are supposedly defending when talking to me? He didn't have any answer. He stopped talking to me. It just looked very stupid. Actually, judging from the ruins that are found, uh, the remains of uh, ancient Rome, and all the, all the maps, which basically look the um, same, all of them, Rome was not at all some sort of a big city, it was a rather small city and if uh, we take its uh, area and uh, calculate its residents taking um, as uh, 2000 uh, people per square kilometer of uh, inhabitants, number of uh, inhabitants, which is uh, somewhat uh, average, then we'll find out uh, that uh, it counted some uh, 10,000 uh, people as inhabitants. The very idea that uh, this type of uh, settlement could um, provide enough number of uh, soldiers to conquer all of the civilized world this idea is very fishy by itself and mainstream historians confess it as well and here is what they say well Romans simply could not uh, find uh, that many soldiers to maintain uh, all of its empire, then how did they, they conquer it anyway? I mean, you go one place and then what, uh, leave uh, the other conquered territories without uh, soldiers? Tho those will revolt and uh, get uh, independent immediately if you leave them like that and you cannot put only slaves in the army because you know if you have too many slaves and only one Roman shouting at the top the slaves will think oh oh just look at this there is only one of them and he's telling us to kill our brothers maybe it's easier to just kill only that one on the top he is only one so so yes uh, uh, even the mainstream historians understand that it is absolutely unrealistic to think that uh, Roma could have uh, uh, gathered such a big army that would conquer all these vast territories and maintain them during constant riots if you see the history of the Roman Empire it's full of riots just all the time so what solution they find for this uh, major contradiction well you know the Romans decided in instead of uh, keeping um, uh, the population subdued with a military force to make um, social improvements and build uh, social buildings and baths and aqueducts for them things like that so that uh, the population will stay happy and uh, will uh, voluntarily remain in the Roman Empire well, that, that's, uh, that's even more ridiculous. So what, uh, there were no soldiers, they all became builders? No, that doesn't fit with the rest of the story they are telling us about the constant uh, riots and constant uh, military, required military presence and wars on the uh, supposedly conquered territories. So instead of making it uh, easier, they actually create a double work for the soldiers. They were fighting, definitely according to their story, on one hand and then at night they had to build the aqueducts and the Roman villas and the Romans, uh, Roman amphitheaters, things like that. Actually it looks even more ridiculous after this remark that they have made. This imaginary Shehirizada Grand Roman Holy Empire seems uh, really unsustainable for a small city like Rome. Then what about the building style? Not only the villas, but the full so-called uh, Roman cities. Maybe they are Roman as connected to the city of Rome because they are built in such a, a Roman style. People think that because the uh, style is called uh, Greco-Roman, it must have something to do with Rome, right? 
As far as uh, Greece, this is just a country that got formed in year 1830. Very recently, there was no Greek uh, nation or country before that at all. Be I'm explaining the Greco part of the Greco-Roman. And the rest, uh, Roman, is uh, connected to the ancient Romaic culture and not with the city of Rome. This style of building and ornaments was a prevalent age before Rome had any role in the world politics because it had some. It was a big city. It was not just not the role we are led to believe. Do you remember the Scythians and the Sarmatians from this old map? Well, they had all the Roman style you want. Here are your Roman looking uh, females from the Thracian uh, gold treasure from Panagyurishti. And Thracians, practically for all practical purposes, is just another label for this uh, Scythian Sarmatian culture. Objects are not enough, let's go to construction. This looks pretty Roman design to me. But it is Thracian, very old, from deep antiquity. Here are your Roman columns. Here are your uh, standard uh, Roman design elements, again very ancient Thracian. Roman emperors were f are famous for their laurel wreaths. So here is your Thracian laurel wreath, much more ancient. Even the uh, mainstream uh, historians give very ancient uh, dating to this uh, Scythian, Sarmatian, Thracian, Dacian artifacts. It is not disputed by anybody that these are most definitely pre-Roman cultures. <laughs> You can see the characters depicted on them wear a Roman togas, the typical Roman dress. So nothing is new, Rome did not invent anything at all. Here are more Roman togas on a ancient Thracian depiction. Forget about inventing anything, it seems at least judging from their construction quality, that Rome was simply built at the later stages of the decay of the old advanced civilization and its uh, knowledge of building, we barely see any megaliths. Only sometimes in the bases of the buildings we see those very smooth stones, which are of different uh, material, and also they fit with each other very well. But the rest, which belongs to a, a subsequent repair work, is just simple bricks. The buildings of this grand Rome, the glorious Rome, are mere dwarfs compared to the antique buildings found in what we are told to be remote provinces of the great empire, provinces which were part of the federation for a very, very short time. And yet they tell us how Rome built everything for them. So in the Arabian Nights fables, they're telling us how the Roman emperors were crazy about luxury, how they built splendid buildings driven out of craziness, they made them unnecessarily opulent and big and Rome was so much superior than anything else on earth. Where is that on the ground? This is a reconstruction of the public buildings in Rome. They are just tiny dwarfs compared to Baalbek and many other more impressive uh, antique cities. This is from Palmyra. To modern people, Palmyra is famous as a Roman city, as if it was built by Rome. That's how most people understand it. And on what is this uh, assumption based? It is based basically on a single 
modern interpretation of the translation of an inscription which may be ancient, it's kind of unsure of unsure origin, which says that Palmyra paid tax to Rome. Even if we assume that the inscription is indeed ancient and that it talks about some sort of payment, it could have been easily also some sort of financial settlement. Financial exchanges as such are not a proof that Rome was a center of a grand empire, let alone that its emperors built Palmyra, the fantastic Palmyra, while they themselves lived in a relatively modest conditions. Now, this is Apamea again in Syria. People who go there, they say there are more columns here than in Rome. The same is valid for Palmyra and many other cities. Leptis Magna in Libya. Again, it is classified as city uh, of the Roman Empire. That's how they present it. And people naively believe it just because they have been trained to put an equation mark between ancient architecture and Rome. Or what about El Gem in Tunisia? We can get some idea of the size and opulence of, of this ancient city by the two grand amphitheaters. And again, it is all Roman Empire-ish. So the Romans could uh, build uh, two coliseums in a far, far away province that they had very little to do with. But when it came to their own capital, they were very economical and built only one. There is a great number of very impressive ancient ruins in a Romaic style. I'm using Romaic uh, to substitute the Roman to avoid confusion. But the penguins are so busy glorifying and singing the eternal glories of the Italian Rome that they don't have time to study them. Look at this huge uh, amphitheater in uh, Albania. Here on Google Earth we see a very small uh, part of the full circle, but it is, it is uh, huge. Another phrase that we can hear very frequently from the penguins that it is the Greco-Romans that uh, put the bedrock of our civilization and culture. So is, this, is there something on the Greek side that I haven't noticed? that would uh, explain the origin of uh, the so-called origin of our civilization. Let's look into this. Unfortunately, the history of the so-called ancient Greece is even more murky than the history of ancient of, of the Roman Empire even. Although mainstream sources tell us that it was the Greek people, the ancient Greek people, who started inventing what civilization is all about, still they could not get themselves together to form a state or a country, which according to the mainstream scale of how smart one is, allegedly that is something that people do when they get smarter. And so the penguins decided not to blame them yet for another grand empire, but to proclaim them as a separate civilization. Very interesting, on what basis did they do that, since I can't find any grounds to even consider them as a separate culture, what to speak of a civilization. Is it because of some uh, sort of uh, artifacts, building style, art or something like that? Not any that are available to the public because um, the uh, art and uh, building style are very very close if not identical to those of the Scythians and Sarmatians that I showed half an hour ago. These are a few more pottery pieces from uh, Thracian, Dacians, Scythians, Sarmatians, which are all basically the same people, a bit artificially divided into uh, various labels. 
So, based on their architecture, art and language, the ancient Greek people were for all practical purposes basically Scythian or Sarmatians. And sure enough, on the old maps, Greece or Elada is on this Scythian or Sarmatian territory. Or we can formulate it the other way around. The Scythians and Sarmatians were actually ancient Greeks. Because some people who are like modern Greeks, they may feel offended by the earlier formulation. But actually the words don't matter. This is not meant to foster any sort of nationalistic ideas. It is not important what kind of modern name we will use as long as we understand the true origin of this antique culture. And another ancient map of uh, Ortelius, again, no mention of any Greece or even Elada. That's how the people who live on, on the territory of uh, Greece used to call their land. So since we notice uh, no empire or any country at all, and we don't see any particular unique or distinct uh, style of anything in this uh, so-called ancient Greece. What, I mean, on what basis did they uh, even group the people together? Who were these ancient Greek people anyway? They have some sort of tribe or something, nation? Further, the penguins assure us that there were uh, many tribes of which we know almost uh, nothing and yet two of them would uh, stand out, the Ionians and the Dorians. But this doesn't seem to correspond at all to the artifacts of ancient Greece because as you can see on the coinage, the presence of black people was rather tangible. And neither the main tribes nor the minor ones that the penguins are listing seem to consist of African black people. And it doesn't even end with simple ignoring. In many cases, there are even suspicions raised that on some of the ancient Greek pottery, white paint has been applied to many figures during the so-called Restoration in an attempt to cover up the big-time black presence in a ladder at that time. We have to be honest and realistic. Basically, we don't even know who was living on the territory of Greece during ancient times. Another weird thing is the very name of the modern country of Greece. How did it uh, come to name itself like that? After all, its residents called themselves uh, Elinas and uh, the land that they live on, they used to call Elada. Well, the penguins not only forced millions of people to start calling their land something else, they also caused them great a deal of trouble by literally forcing on them via the media of the educational system to write and speak some unnatural to them language. That language was a blend from what the people were actually using with many additions of uh, penguin ideas of how the actual ancient Greek language was, which was mainly some sort of uh, guesses based on some not very reliable medieval books. For full 150 years, the poor Greeks were tormented with these uh, language uh, reforms and only in the recent years, finally, they allowed them, you know, to use and talk whatever language you want. But let's return to the original question. What is the meaning of this uh, ancient uh, Greek civilization, as uh, the penguins call it? Did they have some sort of special symbols or something? Not really, they were using the swastika symbol again of the Scythians and Sarmatians to which they apparently belonged. 
for all practical purposes there are the decoration motif and temples and everything is full of those very same swastikas that are seen all over the world. Nothing new here. Okay, we haven't had success so far with the so-called ancient Greek civilization. Let's take it from another angle. There are so many uh, ancient Greek inscriptions on temples and other buildings. So who made those? Ay, 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 and here it gets very uncomfortable for the penguins. The problem comes from the fact that, that uh, the language that the modern people uh, speak there on this land has absolutely nothing to do with these inscriptions. And not only that, uh, the tribes which supposedly, according to mainstream historians, there is a long list of uh, minor tribes living there as well, there is no artifact in any way confirming any of these uh, tribes actually using this language. And as we saw in one of the earlier episodes, of this uh, series, uh, this uh, very language is a part of a group of such uh, languages that were used over a vast area. Greece has no reason to claim ownership on it. They were used uh, uh, in many places and they evolved on the basis of the runes that were used even wider. Basically, runes are found worldwide. That is why the penguins came up with an idea. They will uh, think of an imaginary tribe called the Greki, Greki something, so similar to Greki, and those must have existed, although there is no evidence of uh, such tribe ever. But it is hypothetical, but it exists as a hypothesis because somebody must have been writing in this language after all. In other words, just anything else but the survivors. On the territory of uh, what people consider to have been ancient Greece, the very same writing was used as everywhere else in this enormous region of the Scythian and Sarmatians. If somebody decides to call it something else, his only purpose would be to artificially separate things. Now let's look a bit into the case of this word they took, the word Greki, as the name of this hypothetic tribe which must have used this writing. Unlike the tribe, that word actually existed and there are a few different ways in which it can be pronounced, in which it, it can be read, either Greki or also as Zretsi. And Zretsi, till nowadays in the Slavic languages, simply means priests. Ah, well, now once we substitute Greki with priests, everything falls into its right place. The priests were writing, they were using this writing, and that's why it was not found amongst the remains of the common people which were basically shepherds and had agricultural pursuits. This is one of the biggest problems that penguins face when they travel to ancient Greece. <laughs> they can't find, well, when they dig, when they do excavations, they never find any of the so-called ancient Greek writing amongst the remains of the actual tribal people of the region. It's just simple instruments for uh, agriculture and animals, things like that, and no ancient Greek so-called writing. Well, it was all for the priests. It, it's a sophisticated language. <music> The Munich uh, professor uh, Vincent uh, Brinkman conducted a very interesting and intriguing uh, research on the subject of how did the ancient uh, statue really look like when they were in use by the ancient people and he found out that they were painted and by testing the 
minute particles that are still left of that uh, paint he could uh, reproduce their original looks so what we can notice from his work is that uh, many of the gods and also uh, people, uh, heroes and uh, people depicted in their daily activities on the Greek uh, statues were actually blonde or with uh, very light hair color. But yet they must have been, either they must have been a minority at that time already or something happened to them because uh, nowadays in Greece there aren't that many blonde people at all. So what about all these supposedly ancient Greek authors and books that we constantly read quotations from? Well, definitely there is uh, some uh, truthful information in them for sure, mixed with uh, semi-truth and frank lies. The problem is simply that we don't know which part is true, since uh, the books, it's the same like the Roman books. They were edited by the Jesuit uh, monks, according to whatever task they had been given. So, there is truth in them, we just don't know which part is that. The real ancient Greek books must have been really, really interesting. That's why the history of fabricators are not showing us even a single one in original form. It's as usual, the copies of the Jesuit monks. A subject that is very rarely discussed or touched is uh, how many of the items exhibited in the museums are really historic artifacts and how many are forgeries, recent or not so recent. For example, an art student was taking a selfie in a museum and uh, he leaned onto the leg of this statue. It broke and let's see how the penguins reacted. The way they reported this uh, gallery owners is that, well, anyway, this was uh, not really that ancient, like 2000 years. It was made, uh, it was a later copy. But uh, strangely, even in their own article, they don't clarify what is a later copy. And in uh, just a few sentences after that, when they talk about this uh, copy, they say, well, the statue was anyway uh, very old and badly in need of uh, repair. It was cracking and all that so so basically again they refer to it as if it is a very old historic statue but yet they would not tell us how old exactly as if they know anyway and of course there is nothing wrong with uh, exhibiting reproductions in museums and copies in the museum as long as uh, that is made clear to the public instead of uh, posting uh, misleading uh, in, uh, labels below the statues, you know, 2000 years old and things like that. And the main question is, since the museum vaults are full of uh, real historic artifacts uh, that are unexhibited with, under the excuse that uh, there is no place in the museum, why do we have so many reproductions when the real ones stay hidden? Not sure what is this, is it uh, really ancient, is it restoration? As far as I understand, um, archaeology students are being told uh, during edu their education that yes, many of the antique so-called uh, ruins are just uh, recently built because uh, centuries ago that was uh, the archaeologists idea of how they should exhibit to the public how ruins look like by building them. Archaeology students are also told that this is a highly disputable practice and that the debates are going on if that is okay. 
I mean, no matter in how polite uh, words they uh, put it, at the, the end they don't put uh, down those fraudulent inscriptions that uh, these things are, you know, 2000 years old when they were built just a few decades ago by so-called uh, restoration workers. Tourists pay international fares to go and see those places, basically they are getting defrauded. Most importantly, if any person is sincerely interested of its uh, history as a human being, how he or she can find out what is real and what is a so-called restoration? Seems to be a photo taken from the time when uh, Pompeii was getting cleaned up, so hopefully here they didn't do any restoration and uh, Hopefully they were just cleaning and here we also see hollow columns. Now this is coming up in the news as destruction of ancient uh, artifacts. Are they really ancient? I mean we were always told that they're made of stone but inside uh, armature is uh, shining up. So uh, did the ancients uh, use the armature as well or just uh, it's completely confusing. How can one find out the truth? More armature sticking out of ancient stuff. This is Indonesia. God knows when this was built. This is uh, from Cyprus. So, if this is really ancient, then why don't they correct the, the school books and tell us that everything was getting cast and not carved out of stone? And if it is a recent work, why don't they uh, put an honest inscription of what it is? I mean, they have pinned it down to the exact year 1075. I mean, bravo, these uh, penguin scientists uh, do they know when the house that they live in is built, the exact year, or do they know who is the exact lover of their wife? But they will surely know in which exact year these columns were built. This I just found on Traveler's uh, blog, he says it's uh, from uh, the wall of an ancient temple in I India. This is a small uh, piece of uh, stone taken from the Great Pyramid of uh, Giza. It looks like the cloth that was uh, used on the side for casting the stones got imprinted. So on the other side we do have substantial evidence about the use of um, geopolymers in the past, so maybe they used the armature as well. And while the real artifacts are staying submerged under water or no permission to dig or no funds to dig, always some excuse, uh, while that is going on, they build completely new things from scratch and call them ancient ruins. This is an excellent example of one such ancient ruin from Germany. If one reads the official information, the tourist information, you would really get the impression that there was something Romaic here. Something with Roman empires. Well, there was nothing there like this. They didn't hesitate to build entire towns to confirm their fraudulent history. The most shining example of which probably would be Troy. They strategically targeted Turkey where you can find ruins next to every village anyway, but they picked one of them, built an artificially aged town around the ruins, and all of a sudden they were screaming around that they have found Troy. Hmm. For full analysis of this ridiculous scam, please refer to the analysis by Anatoly Fomenko. The the tomb of uh, Tutankhamun also seems to be partial forgery. A lot has been uh, written and uh, filmed in terms of uh, trying to investigate uh, the really suspicious circumstances under the discovery of this uh, tomb of uh, Tutankhamun. But uh, really, the uh, Fomenko and Nusovsky uh, analysis uh, stands out. Uh, uh, as most uh, detailed uh, analysis and meticulous uh, research, so I would advise everybody interested to get familiar with their research on that.
Now let's visit Sagalasus in Turkey and see how the myths of the almighty Roman Empire and Greek civilization are being created and maintained. Because it has its own uh, large amphitheater and impressive uh, antique ruins, but that is common for many villages in Turkey. Beautiful, large, very large antique statues were unearthed in Sagalassus. Immediately it was announced that large Roman statues have been found. They even recognized the guy immediately, it is Marc Marcus Aurelius and nobody else. How did they know? Was it uh, written somewhere or some other clue or something? It is just presented as um, absolutely uh, scientific, uh, undisputable truth without providing any evidence or a reason whatsoever. And when they say Roman, people subconsciously, of course, connected with uh, this uh, so-called Roman Empire with uh, its center in Italy. Actually, the very name of ancient Greek civilization is quite misleading because it uh, automatically directs one's attention to one's towards the current country of Greece, its geographical location. One gets the impression that was the center, while the Greek ruins, they're mostly found in Turkey. They're bigger, they're more impressive, they are spread on bigger territory. It's just much, much more of them. Why didn't they call it the ancient Turk civilization? Or did they take the word Greek from that imaginary tribe that they conjured? The tribe they call Greki? Well, if they would have simply used the right words and called it the civilization of the priests and called the things with their proper names, it would be okay as well. But they pretend that they cannot read things which every Slavic person even without any special education, can read for them. You can read the diaries of the travelers or their blogs. They all say, if you want to see ancient Greek ruins, go to Turkey, don't go to Greece. <laughs> And again in Zyugma in Turkey, they excavated some of the finest Romaic mosaics which have survived till now. So what we read here? Andromeda! All the characters are perfectly readable for all Slavic people. If this image was uh, entitled like a modern mosaic, I would believe it because we still write like this. But what they told me in school is that this is some two, three thousand uh, years old language, which I can understand only via the experts, and that the current modern Cyrillic writing was invented by the brothers Cyril and Methodius. Some mere eleven or so hundred years ago. And people believe it. <clears throat> also, there are countless monuments of these two brothers always shown with the books and how they invented the Cyrillic characters. That's why they're named Cyrillic after Cyril. And they make the children learn patriotic songs narrating how the brothers invented the alphabet and gathered them for social events to wave flags, shout slogans, and do all kinds of stuff glorifying the alleged creators of the Cyrillic alphabet. And it wasn't just the Etruscan inscriptions you can read using that Cyrillic alphabet and uh, now the so-called ancient Greek and Roman all the way in Jordan. This was during the excavations and it looks like this now. So here in straightforward modern Writing, it is written, Christe. I mean, the same word if you go now to an Orthodox church, the priest will be singing this because this is how Jesus Christ is called in the Slavic languages. And the entire region is like this in Israel. When one visits the 
biblical sites countless inscriptions with this very same writing, often readable for modern people without the need of any interpretation or translation. And what happens when uncomfortable ruins are found at places where they should not be like St. Petersburg? I mean, officially, people there were really monkeys just a few centuries ago. They didn't uh, have any ancient culture at all. But uh, ancient ruins came up. Well, what to do with them? What to do? The real archaeologists that were working on them, well, their working contracts were just cancelled and new, correct ones were appointed that quickly excavated the site. That's what they call it. With bulldozers. And do you notice the pile of uh, stone behind? Those are the r ancient ruins ready for disposal. So, if it wasn't the great Holy Roman Empire or the ancient so-called Greeks that built all this uh, Romaic uh, antique stuff, then who did it? All that was described in the old books and that's why they made those huge bonfires in all European cities, really, really huge fires. It wasn't the Man Martin Luther uh, books nor all that reformation war was about church bells, organ music and translating uh, books into other dialects. It was not by chance that they even organized border police at that time to search the travelers and check out all their books and writings and burn anything suspicious. It was really very important for them to erase all traces of history. But we are fortunate few of those banned books survived till date. One such a book is the work of uh, the Italian monk Mavro Urbini. He bases his uh, writings on a few hundred older books and also provides extensive uh, list, uh, reference list from where did he take this information and almost all of those books are in the banned list and are lost forever. This is what Mavro Urbini tells us about the people who built everything that we call Greco-Roman, or at least taught the local people how to build it. It is not by chance that they are called the scattered ones, Rasayanami, because they divided in small groups and then they went away to spread the seeds of their culture. So where did these scattered ones, Rasayanami, go to spread their culture. And then he lists practically all the provinces and uh, places where we see the so-called uh, Romaic or Greco-Roman culture and ruins. In this way, the terms scattered refers really and exactly to the survivors. So I'm not really trying to introduce some sort of uh, new hypothesis about history. I'm just trying to establish the old knowledge that got lost. Let's now visit uh, Castel Sant'Angelo in Italy. After all, it was uh, the residence of the popes and maybe they, there were some uh, artifacts, inscriptions or something that could tell us about the real history. What we see there are the emblems of the various uh, popes placed uh, very high on the building, places that are difficult to access. And yet, they are all vandalized and uh, broken in a very ugly manner. 
somebody must have had a very good reason to climb that high and destroy them in uh, this ugly way. Because there is official explanation for everything that was uh, done driven by religious hatred to certain pope and that's why they destroyed the uh, shields they couldn't uh, look at them they hated him very strange though they made the endeavor to place scaffolding and stuff and climb so high and uh, destroy his uh, emblem and yet they left intact his statues that are easily reachable they were so full of hatred that they couldn't look at his emblem yet they left his name clearly visible and intact with big letters and how come that actually all the emblems of uh, or most of them are destroyed of most popes even though they didn't belong to this pope that was uh, the hated one most likely these emblems and shields were uh, destroyed in this way because they didn't fit the fabricated history and not because a certain Pope could not stand one of his predecessors and that's why climbed so high and destroyed the emblems of all other predecessors. Castel San Angelo is a well-maintained and luxurious residence. It is very unlikely that its own residents would destroy it in such a barbaric manner. So, of course, again, we don't have any authentic Roman books. Always, whatever is released to the public is uh, from some uh, medieval copies. And interesting that they never give any um, technical specifications which can be of help to the modern man. For example, they say there is a mention that the Romans had cars on sails driven by wind. Well, some people some enthusiasts make such cars even now maybe they could uh, benefit from the ancient specifications but no such details are never never released always they um, give tabloid gossip type information out like for example oh the romans invented the kissing for us so this is what we were doing before the romans told us well you can kiss yeah, this is how we were before that. I mean, how would they know what were the Romans doing in their bedrooms? But by pretending that they know even such minor details and say it on TV, the people get the impression that, uh, oh, even such minor details are very well known. And then their attention is distracted and they don't even see the big picture that we don't have a single artifact or authentic document that would suggest the very existence of the great super fantastic Roman Empire. There is none. There are plenty of Romaic style ruins, but this doesn't mean that the capital of all that or the source of all that was Rome in Italy. Not at all. The most impressive Romaic style ruins are far, far away from Rome. So, back to the point of the technology on the old coins, on the old depictions, we see technical stuff in the skies. So, where are the details of what was all that? Well, instead of releasing details of what kind of technology was uh, used, they keep the books lost and publish only meaningless gossip. Or what about the famous Farnese cup that is supposedly uh, an antique artifact 2000 years old? It's made of an extremely hard uh, stone, sardonyx. We are being assured that at that time there was no technology that uh, could allow them to work with that stone, let alone make such marvelous art out of it, fine art. Well, in this case, most likely it is just a 
200 years old artifact as most other antique artifacts that were being shown. But uh, grossly mistaken dating uh, cannot explain things always. For example, the very famous uh, Lycurgus cup that uh, changes its uh, color. Nanotechnology was uh, used to manufacture it. And uh, even the modern engineers uh, took wisdom from it and did reverse engineering to improve their nanotechnologies. So we saw a very tangible black presence in Roman times, in the so-called ancient Greek times. And then we continue to see lots of depictions of uh, noble and affluent African people in what we call medieval art. So again, the penguins lied to us about the black people as well. They are telling us they were not there in Europe. First, when the Europeans saw them, they used them as circus items, mocked them, things like that. Which is yet another tool to ignite hatred between people just because they are of different color and make them unaware that in the very recent past they could coexist not only peacefully but also for mutual benefit. On the other hand, lots of the art shown now is officially dated as medieval. But as we know, the new chronology project is a much more sincere attempt to reconstruct our past. According to it, when we remove these artificial 1,000 years which were added, a lot of what we would normally call antique would actually turn out to be medieval. This is actually confirmed by the countless paintings on which, from our perspective, medieval characters wear antique togas. And vice versa, in the antique scenes, we see medieval elements, even flags, technology, things like that. The penguins attribute all this from their point of view. It was anomalous to the stupidity of the artists who didn't know what in the world they were painting, who were ignorant. They were confusing the dresses of the different eras. But... Looking at the detail into which the historic artists would go, I doubt very much that they would make such stupid mistakes. On the contrary, they would give attention to the smallest detail in the dress, and they would very often paint exactly what they see. And the history of slavery as well, it is all lies. When we hear historic slavery, we immediately think about the Caucasian people enslaving the black ones. But it wasn't like this at all. Actually, all races were victim of this slavery thing, including the Caucasians. The slavery was a tool to lower the human consciousness by causing extreme distress to people. All races were a victim of that. It was not organized by one race against another, but it was rather organized by the enemies of the human race and carried out on the ground by bribed people, those who have sold their souls, which again were amongst all races. And to make it look that it had something with Africa in particular, they used the old proven technique. The slavery in other places was simply called with other names. Let me read to you a very depictive uh, historic quote describing the type of slavery in Russia. It was called Krepusnoya Prava, but the fact that they put a different label on it doesn't change the essence 
of what it really was. The noble cavalier Francesco de Colo was in the area of Moscow in year 1518. He says, People are put for sale on the markets along with the chicken and other domestic animals. All you need is just to make a contract with the seller. In the city of Moscow, some of uh, our chaps bought a couple of uh, very young virgins, aged 15 to 18. Truly amazingly beautiful girls. They got them for entertainment. The bargain price was very good. Only one Ducat or one Ungar. And not only you get the girls for such a bargain price, but when they have uh, children, they remain your own and then you can sell them as well on this same market. It is true that they don't allow them uh, to be exported from the country, but as long as you own them inside the country, you can really do with them whatever you wish. Millions of white people were slaves in these times when foreign entities took over the governments and people of the Asian race as well. So many of them were victims of very cruel slavery conditions. All the actual facts and number of affected people are in most cases neither hidden nor denied by the mainstream sources. People simply don't look for them or when they stumble upon some of them they do not make any conclusions just because it's Already from childhood they are contaminated with this pre-given conclusion about slavery, which most people assume is based on facts, while as most things in the official history, they are not based on facts but on the propaganda trends of the history fabricators, who in their turn are just a branch of the reality fabricators who keep us enslaved in this miserable reality. The only way to get out of this predicament is to unlearn all the false so-called facts, truths and behavior patterns which they have already implanted in us. The historic fictions of the history fabricators are a very small part of everything that we have to unlearn to become free. Why did they decide to exaggerate the importance of uh, Rome so much? Is it because it's in the Western Europe? To reinforce the authority of the institutions, corporations and uh, certain entities that are above law and make them look like givers of civilization? Or was really Rome really a great center, center of the degradation ideas in the Romaic society?